sleeps. That's the nothing personal word of the day. It is Monday, March 18th, 2024, and you've got two sleeps left until Major League Baseball starts its season in Seoul, South Korea. The Dodgers and Padres are there. They are playing exhibition games. You wouldn't know there's two teams there right now because all of the attention short of Tatis and his special spikes is about Shohei Otani, about the Dodgers, about the behemoth that is the Dodgers team. All of the offseason was owned by the Dodgers. And now we are two sleeps away from finding out whether that will actually translate as the 162-game season begins to unfold. Before we start, I'm going to, over the next couple of days, give you a few stories that are happening. I'm not going to give you the top four rotations or the top three designated hitters, but there's a lot going on as this season starts. I would say people are talking about Blake Snell and Jordan Montgomery, more Blake Snell as the top story right now, having an unsigned player this late. It's, you know, in football, players hold out. It happens. But in baseball, you rarely see, even Scott Boras doesn't hold out players this late generally. Rumors that Houston may be making a play for Blake Snell and that Blake Snell leaked out to the media a great leak. Be willing to sign a two-year deal for a ton of guaranteed money, high AAV, with an opt-out after this year, exactly as we thought Boris would have to settle for after realizing that what he's asking is not going to work. And the Dodgers, there's not a team that couldn't use a starting pitcher at the moment. The injuries are just insane. We'll get to some injuries that happened over the weekend, but I want to start with the Dodgers and Otani. Otani unveiled his wife last week. Such a, it, I don't think that I can properly explain to you, maybe on a mailbag that we may do over the next month or so, talking about the difference between cultures in Japan and the U.S., how players, Japanese players, when they come to Major League Baseball, what it's like, my experience with Ichiro. One of the things that is not talked about enough is the attention that these players get both in Japan and in the U.S. and in Korea. Funny enough, Korea and Japan are not exactly best buddies, but Otani is extraordinarily popular in Korea. And when he announced he was getting married, remember he did that on his Instagram? Koka, this was funny. He made an announcement that, oh, by the way, I'm married. And oh, by the way, I will unveil my wife at some point. She's a normal person. Well, that's good. I wouldn't want to think that he was marrying his dog. But it turns out that she's a former professional basketball player and she's with him in Korea. And when it was announced he was getting married, they actually broke into regular programming in Tokyo and in Japan to talk about this news. But what the baseball people are more interested in is what Otani will be like at the top of that lineup. They know he's not going to pitch. That's been announced. But now... They're beginning to trickle out that he could play the field at some point this season. If I'm Andrew Friedman and I have signed Otani to the 10-year $350 million deal, 20-year $700 million deal, it's actually a 10-year $20 million deal and a 20-year $700 million deal. He is rehabbing his elbow from what he called was not Tommy John, but it was. And the question is, why would you ever play him in the field where you cannot replicate game throws? So we would, God, we spent so much time trying to do simulated games for players who were injured or players who had a bad arm. I remember when Ozuna couldn't throw, we'd put him in the field pregame or we'd do simulated games. Hey, man on first, single to you, get the ball to third. Man scoring from second, fly ball to left field. And you try to simulate the arm action. You try to simulate game conditions. You try to simulate what your arm will do when it is trying to throw out a runner. And I don't mean just throwing the ball back into the infield after a single. I mean, when there's an action play, you cannot simulate it. As hard as we try, and this happens with pitchers, simulated games, he pitched four innings in a simulated game. He faced 12 batters in a simulated game and struck out eight. 
it's all eyewash. And that's the same with hitters, getting, getting hitters some good at-bats where you can lead off every inning in a simulated game. Frankly, you can bat every time if you want in a simulated game. But in an actual game, when Otani, who's got an amazing arm, when he is forced to throw, whether they put him in right field or left field, doesn't matter. I think the juice is not nearly worth the squeeze. And the reason I think that is that you're paying him to be a two-way player. You've already lost 10% of that because he's missing this year pitching. I could easily argue you're going to miss the last three years of him being a quality two-way player given his age. So now we're down to six years of possibly being a two-way player. It's just not worth it. So I think that he will DH the entire season. May he be a replacement? There is one thing, though, about DHs. Coca, side note, this came up during the negotiation. I don't know if I've talked to you about this. When there was a fight between owners about whether or not the DH should be the universal DH, there were years spent arguing this. As a National League president, all my 18 years, I loved no DH. I loved having the pitcher said I thought it was a better game. I thought it was more strategic, more interesting. Plus, I loved having a good hitting pitcher, whether it was Dontrell or somebody else. But the thing about universal DH is it increases the payroll for every team because you're paying a ton of money to a DH as exemplified by Otani and that replaces a player making the minimum. So it was a big give when the owners agreed with the players to go to universal DH. But the thing is DH is now being used as a way to park either poor defensive players or players who are hurting and need a quote quasi day off. So you read a lot about a three-man rotation for DH where you'll play the field two out of three games and then DH the third game. Having a full-time DH or a player who can only DH as an executive is actually a disadvantage for your team, Poppy notwithstanding, but it's a disadvantage in that J.D. Martinez sort of notwithstanding. It's a problem because it doesn't give you the flexibility that was the original point of the designated hitter. So we'll see what the Dodgers do, but it will definitely be interesting. I spent the weekend, I think I called you Coca. I can't remember. I spent the weekend thinking about how happy I was to be doing nothing personal, not running a team anymore. Thinking about the injuries that happen, you're getting ready for. We had a guy get injured on an, in an exhibition game. I do not remember the year. We went to play our minor league team. You get paid to go to your minor league affiliate, you play an exhibition game before the regular season starts. And we had a player get injured that game. It's literally your worst nightmare as it relates to running a team when someone gets injured this close to the regular season. The two injuries happened this weekend, one way more important than the other. I'll start with the least important one. That was Joey Votto, really exciting. He signs with the Blue Jays. His first at bat as a Blue Jay home run, and then he rolls his ankle stepping on a bat. The reaction of the Blue Jays was one of not remorse, one of not despondency. It was actually Rolaid's relief because the plan with Votto was not to have him start on the big league roster when the season started, is my guess. And now they can hide him on the injured list, get him ready, get him some at bats at the minor league level, whether it be Buffalo or somewhere else, maybe down in Dunedin at their, at their Florida facility, and then bring him back. But the injury that really caught my attention was the Marlins second year player, potential Cy Young candidate, Yuri Perez. Yuri Perez got taken out of his last start with what they called a broken nail. And that broken nail turned into elbow soreness. Let me explain. Although, let me try to just sum up, given the time. Ooh, I think we just had a total power surge here where I am. Coke, I don't know if we're still live. Are we still live? Everything still work? I just had a flicker. Are we good? We are not good. We are good. Then let's keep going. So Josh Beckett used to have these blisters, and he'd use blister cream. And there's pitchers who crack their nail because of the way they dig their nail into the ball. It can crack. Nails can break. 
you definitely will get taken out of a game for precautionary reasons if you have nail issues or blister issues because you don't want to change the grip on the ball because A, your pitches will be less effective, and B, you could be compromising your elbow and shoulder if your release is different in any way. So Yuri Perez leaves the game, and then the next day they announced that he is going to see Dr. Meister. Now, that may not sound like a big deal, but that's the same doctor who did the Tommy John for Sandy Alcantara, the other Marlon Cy Young award-winning pitcher who's out for the year. Yuri Perez was being counted on by the Marlins. Now they have to test their pitching depth. And it reminded me of the story that I think I told last week, and I want to reiterate, you cannot have enough depth. Forget allocating money to your bench. Forget allocating money to anything other than finding starting pitching depth, which is why the price of a fifth starter, Lance Lynn, goes to $11, $12 million, because all that matters is depth. I feel for the Marlins. I feel for all these teams dealing with injuries. There is one team I do not feel for, and that is Coca's favorite team, the New York Metropolitans. Steve Cohn did a media session, and when Steve Cohn meets the media, we've got ourselves a segment. He is entering season four. He is right in the middle of his championship window, a World Series in three to five years. Four is Price is Right, baby, right in the middle. Except no one's picking the Mets. Steven, you pick your nose, not your friends. No one is choosing the Mets to actually make the playoffs. Barely people are choosing them to finish above 500. What is their uh, over under Coca? I assume if I had a guess, it's somewhere in the 70s. I would say 78, maybe an over under for the for the Mets. It's probably what it should be. I don't know what it actually is, but 81 and a half via DraftKings. Under. Take the under for the New York Mets at 81 and a half. I mean, if you're so inclined to do such things. So Stephen Cohen meets the media, and he talked about Pete Alonzo, and I really love this. Get ready. He's got to deal with Pete Alonzo. Pete Alonzo is entering free agency. He's got one more year. He's making like $20 million this year. He hired Boris just to do his free agent contract. Poor agent who was with Alonzo all the way, and now Boris is going to get the commission on his free agent deal. He's optimistic about signing him. And he had a comment about his relationship with Boris. He said he has a good relationship and he feels that could help the Mets. Quote, I enjoy the conversation. I thought Steve Cohn worked for a living. How can you enjoy spending 30 minutes on the phone listening to drivel? And how could you be so delusional that you think that your relationship with Scott Boris, which you may think is good, which is not, will actually, do you think it'll give you a discount? You think you'll get some sort of benefit for this great relationship? It's completely absurd. Nor did signing Edwin Diaz or Brandon Nemo give you any leg up in signing Pete Alonso. It's all just very bizarre. But then Steve Cohn really caught my attention when he said that when you talk with players, they said the defense is going to be so much better than last year. Last year, we were giving four outs in an inning. So I'm just curious with your lineup changes, where is it that your defense improved? I'm just not sure I understand that. So I figured that's all Steve would say that interested me. But then, then he did it. His final statement that I'm going to talk about. I love you, Stevie. You know I do. We've talked about being competitive, Steve Cohen said. My expectation is we will be. I think the club looks pretty good. I think general expectations have been pretty low, and I think we're going to surprise to the upside. This is the owner who was the savior to all Mets fans. This is the man who's going to get rid of the chop shops. This is the man who wants nothing more than to win a World Series and will spend ridiculous amounts to get there. And now he's totally changing course, realizing how much money he's lost and how it makes no sense to lose that amount of money. Now he wants Mets fans to say, hey, we're now the Diamondbacks. 
we could surprise on the upside. That is music to the ears of the other 29 owners that Steve Cohn is being brought back to the pack, at least with his recognition that winning is so difficult and overspending is silly and that losing money is absurd. So Steve Cohn, what else can we talk about in baseball? I absolutely agree with John Moziliak, the president of baseball operations with the Cardinals. I don't like managers going into lame duck years. I've explained on nothing personal why I don't like it. I feel as though it can somehow usurp the power of the manager in the clubhouse. I feel as though that managers may manage differently and go full Girardi where every day is game seven of the World Series. You generally want a manager to understand the ebbs and flows. You want a manager to stay relatively calm, not too many ups and downs. It's a very, very long season. But one thing that we always knew with our managers is when we were going to extend and when we weren't. And I always love to pay at least two managers. <laughs> love fiery managers and paying extra managers not to manage. It was my specialty. I was absolutely taken aback this weekend when the Cardinals agreed to extend their manager, Ali Marmol. There was no particular reason for that. They underperformed last year by a lot. There is a risk they will underperform again this year, though they certainly had an offseason where they tried to plug holes with rubber arm pitchers from Sonny Gray on down the line. So they have a chance to get innings. But there's something about that team. And I went south, and I love St. Louis. You know I do. But I went south ever since Nolan Arenado came out and talked about the lack of leadership and how they're counting on Matt Carpenter. But for whatever reason, they extended Marmol's contract. And then the reason given is the most important thing for Ali, is what Mazuliak said, the coaches or the players, is to know that we stand behind them. We believe in them to go into the season as a lamb duck manager just deemed to be the wrong strategy. I'm sorry, you just had that epiphany this spring. Did you have a complete change in what your philosophy was because you watched the team and said, oh, let's do something to help them because they're helping us. Oh, we built this team to be competitive. The offseason moves were done months ago. What possibly could have changed? I have a theory. It is a weak executive, and I've been guilty. It is a weak executive that gets met by players. Players go up to you and say, hey, we need this. Please do that. Please take care of our manager. Take care of this player. Take care of this coach. Take care of a suite on the road. Take care of tickets for my family and the people who are not my family but want to be. You think players went up to John and said, hey, let's extend Ollie? Do you think Bill DeWitt, the owner, said, oh, I really don't want a lamb duck manager. Let's extend him right now. I don't think any of that happened. I think John may have just looked at his situation and said, I probably should have done this earlier. I got permission from DeWitt to blow out the money because he's likely not going to be with us through the extension. So why don't we just do it now? But the timing was very bizarre. What if the Cardinals get off to a slow start and they're 5-18? and 18? Do you still have that same vote of confidence for your manager after a bad season last year when people assume that he starts this year on the hot seat? Do you think the articles of him on the hot seat go away because he has an extension? There is almost an inverse correlation between getting an extension like this in spring training and being off the hot seat. None of it makes sense to me. So then he thought to himself, John was elected, how do I address what Samson's going to say on nothing personal? And so he did. We just don't want something where if we stumbled or got off to a slow start, all of a sudden everybody is looking over their shoulders. It's just not fair to everybody involved. The timing of this, as we started thinking more and more about it, had to be dealt with now, not something mid-season or at the end of the year. Horse hockey. That's literal horse hockey. I mean sort of literal. I guess there aren't horses playing hockey. But you're telling me that now when the team gets off to a slow start, you'll stand behind the extension and say, don't worry, everyone. 
keep calm. It's like the marching band leader in Animal House. There's no way you're going to keep calm when people are piling up at the wall. All right. What's next? Wait to see. I'm going to tell you something's going to happen. If it does, great. If it doesn't, fine. Let me give you a wait to see right now. The Cardinals have an over-under, according to DraftKings, of 84 and a half. One, the Cardinals will go under. Two, Marmol will not make it through this extension, thereby making this extension a total waste of money. Wait to see. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to review a movie that I can't believe I watched, but you're welcome. I'm going to save you two hours of your life. And then we're going to talk about the trade that happened in the NFL this past weekend where Justin Fields is no longer a member of the Chicago Bears. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. We are live every day, Monday through Friday. Coca, someone pointed out to me, sort of like when people said to Jeff Probst on Survivor, stop saying, come on in, guys. So now he just says, come on in. I guess it's true. I always say we're live every day, 8 a.m. And someone pointed out, I wish you did a show Saturday or Sunday, but you're only Monday to Friday, so you can't say every day. Fine. Monday through Friday, 8 a.m., Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel. Get ready. We have a ton, a ton. That's hyperbole. We have several really cool announcements coming during the course of this week. So look for them. But every day I watch a movie, no matter what. I watched this morning, Coke. I'm not reviewing it today, but I was in the theater this morning at 311. I don't know why. Just always excited about the week. Sunday nights, I can't sleep well. I ran 16 miles yesterday, Coke. I can't really move my back or my legs at the moment, training for this London marathon, not really training, doing long runs. So I'm in the theater. I put on Ferrari and uh, I was very thankful that I watched Madam Web yesterday so I don't have to watch it ever again or think about it after these two minutes of review. Madam Web is the new Marvel movie with Dakota Johnson, Sidney Sweeney and others. There is a chance that if I were put together my list of top 10 worst movies of all time that I've seen, Madam Web will be in that top 10 list. It is an insult to Marvel that it's the same opening with that red and that the cartoon reddish stuff that opens these movies, that it's the same as Iron Man or the Avengers. The concept is that Dakota Johnson is a spider, I guess, or was a spider, and the bad guy is a spider, or her mother collected spiders, and Sydney Sweeney becomes a superhero, but she's a high schooler. What is this, euphoria? There's not one redeeming quality of Madam Web. So I end the review by saying, please, don't see it. Okay. The Pittsburgh Steelers. I know Jessica's excited of the Levitar group. I'm sure that Steelers fans are excited. Michael Hill's a big Steelers fan. I'm sure everyone's happy because the Steelers got Russell Wilson for $1.2 million. He was going to come in, maybe compete to be the starter, maybe be the starter, maybe be the difference maker. And I'm getting mentally prepared to watch, watch Russell Wilson. And then all of a sudden, it's announced that the Chicago Bears, contrary to what I believe they would do, have traded Justin Fields to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And in return, they got four first-round picks, four players in one of the most unbelievable deals of all time. It was a 79-to-1 trade. You just don't see that in the NFL anymore. Oh, no. Hold on. I misread that. Let me see that again. The Bears trade Justin Fields and got a bucket of deflated footballs in return. Can you believe that? Did you see the return? What the Steelers had to trade to get Justin Fields? As though the Bears were holding a fire sale at some point. I was immediately struck as to why the Steelers were making this trade. 
especially when Mike Tomlin called Russell Wilson after the trade or right as it was being announced and said, Russell, don't worry, buy a house in Pittsburgh. Maybe you can pick up your Denver house, the most expensive house ever listed for sale in Denver. Take your indoor yoga studio, put it on the back of a semi, have Carl Malone drive it all the way to Pittsburgh because we love you, man. You're here and you're going to start. Why would Mike Tomlin already say that Russell Wilson is going to start to Russell Wilson when Justin Fields may be better than Russell Wilson? But be that as it may, that's only the second thing that struck me about this trade. The first thing that struck me about this trade is that the Bears, per ESPN, apparently had a better offer with more draft capital from another team, but instead sent Fields to Pittsburgh because they thought that it would be better to continue his development. Give me one second here, Coca, as I try to imagine the time that I traded a player thinking I really want that player to go to a destination where he'll get, he'll get better coaching, better development, and it would be way better for his career. Hold on. I'm going to come up with it. Give me a second. I'll, I'll come up with it. It happened in Major League Baseball once, and I think I would have done it, and there is no way I'm going to remember who it was. And Coke, if you come up with this, it would be brilliant. There's a team who traded a player to San Francisco so he could be near his ailing mother, and I thought that was outstanding. That was not about development. That was about doing something for a player as maybe one of the nicest things you could do for a player other than giving a player his 10-year pension when the player didn't deserve a roster spot or a coach doing the same thing. What are the Bears in the business of? Are they in the business of winning games? Are they in the business of actually not having the first pick every year? Are they in the business of trying to get a publicly funded stadium in Chicago? Or are they in the business of actually trying to help another team? It was Steven Piscotti, you're exactly right, when they traded him to the Athletics. I was, I was in the neighborhood. I was in the Bay. When the lights go down in the city, Piscotti was there. That was nice. Why would the Bears turn down a better offer to help in Justin Fields' development? Because they promised we wouldn't leave you hanging. We'd have your situation figured out because we're so loyal to you. We love you, man. I find it to be completely unreasonable that the best they could do was a sixth round pick, but don't worry, it can become a fourth round pick if Fields plays 51% of Pittsburgh snaps, which would make him the starter over Wilson. Or it just means Wilson's ineffective and Mike Tomlin's call didn't mean anything. And then Fields takes over. And then don't worry, the Bears really got an hawk. Oh. Sit right there live. And the Bears got a haul of a fourth rounder. So the Steelers now go into the season with Wilson and with not Pickett. Is, has anyone made the Wilson Pickett joke yet for the Steelers? That's funny. This weekend, the Steelers traded Kenny Pickett, or last week, they traded him to the Eagles. The Steelers got a third round pick, two seventh round picks. All they had to give was Pickett and a fourth round pick. I wonder whether they were rewarding Pickett when Pickett had come out and said, I must tell you, I'm not happy that we just traded for Russell Wilson. So Russell Wilson gets traded. He claims he finds out on social media. Then he says, hey, trade me. And so they did especially after Mike Tomlin had promised Pickett that he'd have a chance to compete. So what's interesting about that, Tomlin says, Wilson, you're starting. He says, Pickett, you'll have a chance to compete. And then they trade for Fields, and then they trade Pickett. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on there in Pittsburgh, except to say this. I'm way more interested in what's going on in Chicago. Chicago has the first pick in the draft. They got that from Carolina. They had the first pick in the draft. And the question is, what are they going to do with it? 
I have a wait to see that's pending that is in major jeopardy of losing. Remember, wait to see. I'll always revisit when I get it wrong. I have doubled down that I thought that the Bears would trade the number one pick, get a huge haul of players, still keep the ninth pick, and then go with Justin Fields as quarterback. With him traded, now they've got to draft a quarterback. They can't wait at nine for the quarterback. In theory, they could switch if they don't want Caleb Williams and maybe trade down and give someone the first pick. But it seems the most likely scenario is that the Braves are going to keep their first pick. Unless, of course, they're playing chess and I'm playing checkers. In which case, they now can get tons of assets back for the number one pick only if they didn't actually have Caleb Williams in mind to begin with, but now everyone thinks they did because they traded fields. So we only have another month to figure this out, but let's hope the Bears have a plan. All right, here we go. It's dance time. Let's dance, as David Bowie would say. The NCAA tournament, it was Selection Sunday yesterday. I do not watch a lot of college basketball. I'm happy to admit that. There's only 24 hours in a day, 22 for me, 24 for the rest of you, minus eight is my guess for many. I did watch Yale play Brown in the Ivy League championship in a game that no one cared about except me, Pablo, and my brother-in-law. But Yale won the game on a buzzer beater and they're going to the tournament. And of course they were spent to Spokane, Washington. That's where they were sent to play their first round game against Auburn. But what interested me a lot about the tournament, and I watched the tournament, I watch every game in the tournament. Well, of course, that's not accurate. You can't watch every game in the tournament because games are on at the same time. I like when they their tip-offs are like 10 minutes apart. Like that makes a freaking difference. Although I guess it does at the end. But in the beginning, you've got the scores going and you're looking at your bracket and you're figuring out, did you choose the right upset of two versus 15? But what I'm always looking for is who are the snubs, who gets left out, how it's all decided. And this year was a spectacular year for teams being left out. And my big focus was on the Big East because of Rick Pitino and because of all the teams that the Big East was going to send. Why does this matter? The more teams in the tournament, the more you get. The further you get into the tournament, the more you get. It is a huge advantage to have as many opportunities as possible to make as much money as possible for money that gets distributed throughout the conference. So when the Big East only got three bids out of the 68 teams, that's 64 plus plans, it is interesting that you look at what happened with St. John's and Rick Pitino. Because from a TV standpoint, it would be outstanding to have him in the tournament. Until you realize that the ratings for the NCAA March Madness tournament, when CBS and Turner, when they're all valuing what they need to pay, they actually don't care what teams are in it. It literally doesn't matter. Even who's in the final four, quick, name the final four teams from last year. Can you do it? I think they're all in the same bracket this year, but can you do it? You may not be able to. One of them, Miami, I think they lost their last 69 games in a row this year. I think one of them may have been FIU or FAU, one of the Fs, one of the Us. That's about as much as I can remember. UConn, they're defending. They must have been in the Final Four. It simply doesn't matter. The value, both from broadcasting, from gate, it doesn't matter which teams travel. None of that matters. So why is it happening that there's so many issues about who's left out and who's not. It's because of the business of the tournament. What's happening is that the NCAA would like to expand the tournament. They would like to find a way to get to, let's say, 80 teams up from 64 who actually start the tournament. And the reason they do is they're trying to come up with more inventory. Why? Because that's what we're all doing on the business side of sports, whether you're the NFL, whether you're the NFL with expanded uh, regular season, more inventory, exclusive playoff games, whether you're the NBA doing the play-in tournament, doing the in-season tournament brought to you by somebody. I already forgot who sponsored the in-season tournament. That's not good for the sponsor. 
everybody's trying to expand playoffs. MLB has always wanted to expand playoffs even more than it's currently expanded. And the reason why CFP, they just expanded. I think they expanded to 12. It'll eventually be to 14. Think about the number of hours of programming. When you are a network bidding for live events, and I'm not talking about Jake Paul against Mike Tyson, what you are trying to do is figure out how many hours you have, and then you're slotting them amongst your networks and you're drawing people to those networks. It's the Emirates NBA Cup. Thank you, Coco. Did you have that off the top of your head? Or did you have to look that up? I had forgotten it was Emirates. You looked it up. Come on. All right, top of your head, I'll give you the credit for it. So the NCAA tournament is going to expand and it's going to expand relatively quickly, certainly in the next one or two years. But it will not take away what we talked about yesterday, last night after the selection show, which is the bubble teams that didn't make it. And one of the reasons they'll give you for the expansion is, oh, we'd like to reward more teams. We'd like to make it more fair. We'd like to have fewer controversies about who's in or who's out. But that's total poppycock. Because if you had 120 teams in the tournament, there'd still be five teams left out of the top 125. So no matter what, that argument is never going to stop. So come up with a better reason. Just acknowledge that the reason why is because you're going after money and we'd all have great respect for you. I have zero respect for the teams who blew off the NIT. St. John's, Ole Miss, Indiana, Memphis, Oklahoma, Pittsburgh, shame on you. You all got invited to the NIT and you all declined. I grant you, it is the backup tournament. It is. But you know what? It's an opportunity to get money for your school. It's an opportunity to get playing time for your players, another game. It's an opportunity for you to not look like you're full of sour grapes. I agree I don't wear my minor league championship rings. They're in a drawer right to my right, actually. Bunch of rings from a bunch of minor league teams in our system that won the championship, and I got a ring. But I would wear it if I didn't have a World Series ring or an All-Star ring or a pinky ring. Winning the NIT is not nothing. It's been the best of the second best. You don't think people like winning the Formula 2 races? You think people don't enjoy winning the Live Tour? I was just disappointed that the coaches said it's because of recruiting and the portal and how angry they are. It's absolutely ridiculous. All right, do me a favor. Please go to lebitardaf.com right now. Sign up. For, uh, Coke, I didn't even tell you this. We had a whole pregame. NPDS still has a bracket on CBS. I have no idea how that got there. Uh, people are entering the bracket pool called NPDS on CBS. I'm not exactly sure how that happened, but please go to lebitardaf.com. That's Lebitard's website. They're doing a merch madness, and I am going to do a bracket on that. And if you beat my bracket, much like if you can beat my Oscar ballot, where only 49 people did out of 5,600, you are going to win a prize from my collection, in addition to whatever Lebitard's going to give whoever wins the pool. That's lebitardaf.com. March Madness. Nothing personal pick of the day. We are 34 and 36. We had the Spurs getting 10 and a half from the Nuggets on Friday, and the Nuggets won by 11. I tip my chapeau to these odds makers. I mean, they don't get it right all the time, but come on, really? Getting 10 and a half and needed to get 11. So we're 34 and 36. Tonight, we're taking the Warriors five over the Knickerbockers. And this is absolutely from my childhood where we could never go to Golden State and win. I was watching the Lakers Warriors game this weekend and something's got to change. You see the clock went out, the 24 second clock wasn't working. So they had the announcer, the, the PA announcer, 10 seconds, five. The final like 15 seconds took 18 minutes. They showed all the board celebrities. We go through contingencies. When you run a ballpark, we do rehearsals for things that could go wrong. So for example, we'll do a rehearsal for a bunch of lights going off and we'll write down 
if this bank of lights go off, we can keep playing. If this bank and this bank of lights go off, we can't keep playing. If we have to turn all the lights off and turn them on, it'll take X amount of time. We go through a rehearsal of how much time it takes to put a tarp on even under a roof. How much time it takes to, if we have to switch out home plate, which is buried. If you've never lifted a home plate, it's not like a base. Home plates are deep in the ground and super heavy. But we'll go through all the different things that potentially could happen. What to do if the scoreboard's out, how we'll communicate to the dugouts, what the balls and strikes are, how we'll communicate to the scores of thousands of people in the stands if your jumbotron goes down. We'll deal with corporate sales with what to do if sponsors do not get their advertisements because the LED boards are out. We go through it all. They got to come up with something better in the NBA. You just have to come up with something better than taking that amount of time. The NBA is way more focused, way more focused on scoring. And they are out there denying. Denial is not just a river in Egypt. I always used to like that. They made it their business. Remember last week we talked about saying, seems like scoring's down, notwithstanding the 140 to 129 bucks win over the Suns this past weekend. Seems like scoring's down. And we were talking about it with that 79-73 game the Knicks and Sixers were involved in. And the NBA came out and they wanted everyone to know this was not a directive from the league. They said it's really the focus of officials. I just want that to marinate for one second. Do you think the officials got together during the All-Star break and said, we're going to really start focusing right now and making sure that the scoring goes down? Do you really think that when the officials get together before a game that they're on their own, the three of them talking about the situation around the game and what's going on and what they need to be doing? No, there's league officials. League officials are completely involved in this. The NBA is claiming that when the competition committee met, they really were talking about offensive players hunting for fouls. They were talking about officiating and how their emphasis is that's what's decreased scoring, not us saying we want a decrease in scoring. Then they wrote a memo so there would be a breadcrumb trail about this situation. What would be wrong with Joe Dumars just standing up and saying, yeah, we don't think it's great for the game to have 69 threes taken by each team every game. We don't think it's terrific when it's 152 to 131. We don't think it's great when there's 25-point blowouts. We want competitive games. We don't want 81 All-Star games. As it is, they are desperate to find meaning for the regular season. They are desperate to try to figure out how to get players motivated. They tried load management, play 65, or you can't get an award. That didn't work. The league pulls the strings of referees. That's not news. That's normal, standard operating procedure. But when you don't want to tell the truth, you get caught in this web of confusing lies where everyone just rolls their eyes. It makes absolutely no sense to me. The thing that makes the least sense to me are people who steal from the poor. Before anyone says anything, using existing tourist tax money to get a public subsidy to build the ballpark is not what I'm talking about. Any sort of ballpark that's been built, nope, I'm talking about a story that came out that may be one of the single worst stories that I've ever come across. Nonviolent edition, of course. There are horrific violent stories that involve violence. You know my view of that. Nonviolent edition. Did you read about what happened in Baltimore where a man, and I'm calling him out, James Michael Harris. If you knew, if you know James Michael Harris, the James Michael Harris, he's 46 years old. 
and he stole money from kids. Did you hear about this? They raised money selling chocolate. He was the treasurer of this kids organization that sells chocolate, gets money. He stole the money out of the bank account. He stole $29,000 from these kids. It's a parent-teacher student association. It's affiliated with a middle school in Essex. He drains the bank account. He then spends the money. And he spent it on online gambling sites. DraftKings is a partner of Nothing Personal. DraftKings is a huge, huge business. I want to be very clear, but I want to be very careful. When you gamble on sports, when you gamble on table games, when you gamble with your friends, when you play dice on the street, there is one very, very simple rule. Gamble with money that you're willing to lose. It's the most simple rule there is. The second most simple rule is gamble with money that's yours. People were all over this weekend criticizing Bruno Mars, saying that MGM owns him with his $50 million in debt to MGM, and that's why he does shows, and that's why... He has a lounge at Bellagio now, except in the same article, they said he earns more than he loses in gambling, but he owes a lot in gambling. If you take your money and you want to spend it and you want to gamble with it, your money, your choice, you know my philosophy, live and let live. I'm in. This guy, James Michael Harris, took money that wasn't his to use it for gambling. And then to make matters worse, he took the money that was raised by the children. So here's what's gonna happen. He's being charged and he's admitted he moved the money. I have an idea of what he can do. Number one, pay the kids back. Are you aware that the chocolate company is still owed like eight grand by the school because they couldn't even afford to pay for the items that were sold that people paid for and then didn't even get the money. They didn't pay their bills. The chocolate company relieved, like forgave half the debt. I think they should forgive all the debt. It's not the kid's fault, but I have an idea. You know, I'm a big fan of deterrence. How about this? Instead of making him just pay a simple restitution of the $29,000, I would like him to personally fund until the end of time, the chocolate drive for the kids, making it only gravy what the kids sell to other parents. He should be responsible to buy everybody's stack of chocolate the entire rest of his life. And I don't mean five years, 10 years, 20 years, however long he lives. There is no hell hot enough for him having done this to these kids. The prosecutors are going to have to decide what they're going to do. There's going to be some sort of plea deal. I don't think he's going to want to serve time for taking chocolate from children. I would assume that he will figure out a way to get the money paid back. But I ask you as we close out today's show, just think to yourself, how low do you have to go to steal the children's chocolate money? Do you think as he was taking it, he just looked at himself, licked his fingers and said, it's just business? Sorry, kids. This is nothing personal.